Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you here for a special event. As we told you folks last week, um, we had uh, pulled the Wealthion audience, gosh, a couple of months ago um, in the wake of my mother's passing. Uh, Lance and I had been talking a lot about the, the issues that uh, a lot of folks are dealing with these days, either having to plan for senior parents, um, how to support them in their later years, um, how to manage the end of life process as they you know begin to make their way out of this world and all the issues that come up along with that. Um, also, we have a number of our viewers that are uh, in the later cohort age-wise and are dealing with these issues themselves. Um, and so there's a lot of interest amongst this audience for guidance and in, in helping people either manage this process themselves and, and how to guide their family uh, along through it as they begin to you know, age age out of this world, or for uh, the, their adult children who are, you know, having to manage their parents through this time. So uh, we were finally able to get a date on the calendar that is right now, where we're going to be joined by some of the um, personal finance uh, specialists, the certified financial planners at Lance Roberts's firm, Real Investment Advisors. Um, so Lance, uh, just set the stage here for what Richard and Danny are going to talk about us to, uh, with us about today. Well, I mean, you know, look, there's, you know, this is always a, a tough battle. Again, it's, it's, as you said, it's becoming a bigger issue now that we have this whole sandwich generation of people where you've got, you know, uh, individuals have to take care of both their parents as well as their own kids. And so they're kind of sandwiched in the middle of this. And plan and, for their own retirement as well. And, 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 and well, and that's the problem. You know, we talk, we talk a lot to people that, you know, they can't really afford to save for their own retirement because everything is going to take care of their parents or it's going to take care of their kids and a combination really of both of that. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a big problem. So Richard and Danny, uh, Richard Grosso, Danny Ratliff, uh, both certified financial planners. And, and again, as I've said before, they're probably two of the very best financial planners that I've ever had to the kind of the opportunity to work with, but very knowledgeable and kind of really all aspects of how to plan for that, whether it's Social Security and Medicare, long-term care insurance, um, you know, how to kind of navigate the, the waters of preparing for this kind of end of life scenario. It's not easy. And, and it's something that, you know, is always the case, right? We never want to deal with it because we have to deal with mortality and we don't ever want to talk about mortality. But these are things that if you can start preparing for them early, it financially makes the whole burden on you so much easier down the road. And particularly at the time of the passing of, of the parent, you're not having to deal with trying to figure all this stuff out at once. And so you can spend your time grieving the loss of your parent rather than spending days and weeks trying to figure out where all the money is and, and who does what and where and what happens. It'll all be prepared for in advance. All right. Well, look, Richard and Danny, they present on this topic all the time. Uh, they're going to give their presentation here for us in just a second. Um, I want to let folks know who tuned in for today's regular weekly market recap. Uh, Lance and I will hop on very briefly after the presentation here that Richard and Danny give. Uh, just give a couple minutes update on what happened this week. But we'll be back again uh, on this channel in the regular time again, picking up next week uh, with our latest deep dive uh, in the weekly market recap. Uh, and without further ado, Lance, let's bring on the guys. Well, Danny, Richard, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, as Lance and I just said, this has been a topic of great interest to a lot of our audience. Um, thank you for putting together today's presentation. Before we jump right in it, can you guys just give a quick introduction to yourself so people know who you are, and then we'll jump right in. Yep, I'm Danny Ratliff, Certified Financial Planner here with RIA Advisors. Um, great topic, Adam. Thanks for having us on. I know there's a ton of questions around this in general, and really a topic that is difficult for many to discuss, so I'm really happy we're covering this today. Yeah, Rich Rosso here at RIA Advisors, and uh, Danny and I are Obviously, we are sort of the financial planning guys. We look at everything holistically. Uh, Lance, obviously, is the portfolio guy. And portfolio fits into the overall picture. But this, this topic is part of what you need to look at holistically. So it's important. It's not pleasant for some people. But we're going to try to make it as pleasant as possible with a bit of a change of perspective that we'll get into in the beginning. All right. Well, I appreciate that, guys. As and as many viewers here know, uh, my mother passed away a few months ago. We just recently went through a lot of this process, and we were one of those families where this really hadn't been talked about beforehand. It was just not a topic my mother really wanted to address. 
And man, it would have been so much easier on everybody if we had just had the discussions in advance and could have been executing a plan as opposed to just trying to put together a plan on the fly in the middle of all the chaos of this stuff. So I think you guys are going to do a real public service here. So I'll stop talking and let you guys get to the presentation. Well, one thing I'll say, Adam, is that's how a lot of people find out. They learn the lessons from an experience that they've gone through. Like, in other words, when you went through that experience with your mom, and a lot of people listening today watching have gone through this or in the process going through this, especially as our parents live longer, they might be living with their children and sandwiched between younger and older generations as, as, as parents. And they are learning what not to do. So in other words, you know, our old school parents didn't want to talk about it. You now might have a different perspective just going through it. And then you have to put yourself in the shoes of your children. So there's a way to take yourself out of, stop making it about you and make it about who you leave behind. And I think you probably learned some pretty valuable lessons about what not to do and how to do it better just from that experience. Well, Absolutely. Um, for sure, it has accelerated. I mean, I was planning on doing this anyways, but it's accelerated the planning that I'm doing with my own kids who are now, you know, college age or close to it. Um, so they're at an age where they can, you know, they're mature enough to begin to, to, to talk about this stuff. But to your point, I totally look at them as a kindness I'm doing to them to have everybody focus on this, you know, somewhat dark <laughs> conversation. But it's a kindness to do it now in, in saving them the burden of getting sandbagged by this later on. Yes. Yeah. What a, what a great way to put it. Yeah. That's All right. Well, gents, uh, show, show us what you got here. I know you got a lot of material because I know you guys, you're, you're out on the road presenting this quite often, right? I mean, you guys are real experts in this. Uh, you call it... Uh, Progression planning, I believe, which is actually the nicest way I've heard anyone label this topic. Yeah, cer certainly a difficult topic that many don't like to cover, but so important when we talk about we so often spend so much time as we're accumulating assets and we don't ever think about what happens to them at the end. And so we're going to address that a little bit, turn the script just a little bit in the sense of giving you a different perspective on how to view this. So we are um, RIA advisors a um, registered investment advisor. We're also Clarity Financial doing business as RA advisors. So please don't take any of this as specific recommendations or advice, but consult with your advisor. Uh, obviously, if you have questions, we're happy to answer. Make sure you work with an estate planner who can help you tie up loose ends, things of that nature. But um, just have to go through that disclosure here quickly. So Rich, talk a little bit about what we're going to get into today. Yeah, first of all, I think... Um... You've got to have a different perspective and think about a few things. Actually, I was excited to start my estate plan um, and, and, and schedule things as best as possible because you really reflect on the life you've had and having the fulfillment of that. And you prepare yourself emotionally and then you start to think about the family and you start to think about what's the legacy I leave behind and what do I want them to think about when I'm gone? And the last thing I want them to think about is dad wasn't prepared, right? So I came up with a new definition for this end of life planning and I call it progression of a life well lived because you reflect back, you reflect on the lives of your children. And it's sort of a, it goes from this cold, ugly feeling to this warm and fuzzy. So it's the methods, methods undertaken to prepare emotionally, followed by the financial and family actions that will mark a legacy of communication, clarity, and harmony. So you see, I am flipping the script, and I don't want you to think it of end of life. I want you to think about it as the beginning of something. And that's why we're going to cover these emotional hurdles, the communication ideas, which Adam probably, mom could have used, unfortunately, and a lot my dad could have used um, as well, my parents, uh, the documents, and then resources and actions. So that's pretty much what we're going to cover today. All right, let's jump right in. So let's talk a little bit about the emotional hurdles, steps to jump uh, to jump in with. So step one, focus on life and legacy, not necessarily on death. And you know, we focus on the end of this when we discuss this and the documentation that you're going to have to fill out is that. But focus on the things you want to leave behind. And maybe it's um, stories. It's uh, looking at different points of view. Um, speaking with the family open, you know, Richard and I talk about this often, you know, people ask us, 
who are the most successful people you work with? And really, it's the it's the families that communicate well. And, you know, we deal with some family office uh, situations. These guys have meetings on a regular basis and the kids are so much better off for it. And it's the same thing we talk about estate planning and this progression as we talk about, you know, moving to different stages in life and getting feedback from your family members is extremely important. You may find out that, um, you know, one family member really uh, wanted one item or, you know, a, appreciated something so much more than somebody else. And yet you may have thought completely opposite. So I think it's really important to have these open conversations and have the discussion frequently where it doesn't have to be, you know, you have it and then it's just done. But as closer as we age, I think it's really important to keep everyone engaged and on the same page. Well, and that's true. So the one thing you got to do as someone who's thinking about this is really look at these baby steps to get to where you need to want to go. Focus on life, not legacy is important. If you ask small business owners, family-owned businesses, and you start the conversation off with legacy conversation, you will, you open up a whole world of options. What does legacy mean to you? What is legacy? It doesn't have to be money. Take the money out. What's the legacy? What kind of memories do you want to leave for those you care about? And, and you know, that visual of having to make sure that you're your family who you love are taken care of. They have less stress when you're gone. These are the things you're going to get remembered by. I can't even tell you how many relatives or people I sit with go, oh my gosh, my mother's estate plan was terrible. Instead of saying, I miss my mom, I it, they start with that. Don't have your family start with that. So I was in, I was in Hendersonville, uh, Tennessee, uh, where Johnny Cash lived. And Johnny Cash, I go visit the cemetery every couple of years, put flowers down on the whole Carter family and the country music. I know all these people years ago. And and uh, I, I found a niche in a plot, like a, a, a niche for cremains, right? And it looks out over the mountain in Johnny Cash's grave. And I said to my girlfriend, I said, I think this is where I want to be. And she goes, we're going to have this conversation here. What better place than a cemetery? It was gorgeous. We had this conversation in the middle of the cemetery. You got to be open to gather points of view and maybe not with your children yet, but friends, what did they do? How are they healing? What documents have they done? You, you have a group of people that you're social with and you're close to outside of family and gather those opinions. Have they done anything? What did they do? How did it work? Become Columbo. So once you get past this, this is a morbid topic and thought to think about the legacy and the life you're leading and will live better. I have one client that put together an estate planning that goes, when I went through this, he wrote his own eulogy. And when I went through this exercise, he says, I'm appreciating my life more, my family more. In other words, this planning is making his life richer today. So that's step one. Step two, these points of view from all these different people, do some reading, then formulize and speak with your family openly, the ones who will be affected, what you're thinking, and gain the feedback. I'm not asking you to do any documents right now. This is a soul search for where you're, when your soul goes, right? I got to know what I'm leaving behind, how am I leaving it? And in a way, I know, Adam, this sounds weird. It's a positive kind of reflection. And that's why I call it progression. I'm progressing to understand myself and my life. I'm progressing to understand how my children would feel. You know, and then there's this an excitement about getting this done. And there's a sense of fulfillment. When we talk to clients, Danny and I, when they're done with this process, and getting all the right things done, they're so relieved that they've taken care of their family properly. And that feeling while you're alive is worth something. It's don't discard that feeling. It's not a morbid feeling. It's like an elation and a, and a relief that you have it done. Yeah, if I can chime here real quickly, Richard, I feel like it's got to be a huge peace of mind for this person, right? To know that they're leaving their loved ones in, in a prepared state, right? But right. to your other point, like it's helping them put their life in context, 
right? right? Where they can look back and say, hey, I now kind of understand the arc of my life and why I was put on this earth and, and, a, and, and how my life mattered, right? So I, I, I gotta love that. that term, though, and I should have put it in there. How dare you? The arc. Understand the arc of your life. And there's still room in this arc to live, but it makes you appreciate that next arc more than ever. So that's well said, Adam. I agree with that. All right. Well, thank you. Glad I could contribute. Yeah, so let's kind of keep moving with those emotional hurdles, Rich. Yeah, so again, this is where we're going to go through. We just went over the four steps, sort of talking about them. Here's some language around them, right? Plenty of life to live. Reframe these internal conversations that you're going to have, right? We're not scrambling to make end-of-life decisions. We're going to speak aloud. I'm going to share my concerns and ideas with my friends and my allies, shine light on the topic. What, what did they... What did they learn? See, the words are sunlight, right? And they are and they are open to those views, right? They open your views to accepting this process. Then you want to go to your children or your loved ones, especially how you're working on your plans, right? You don't want dead documents to speak for you, right? Estate documents are cold legal validation, but they are not shared warmly by you. If I find out in an estate document that I left all the China to my daughter versus my sons who wanted it for their daughters, I create a rift from the grave. So I want to speak openly with family. The dead documents that you put together, that's not the fun part. And that those documents can't speak for you. They'll validate what you want to happen, but you've got to wrap it in the warm and the fuzzy. And then you're going to ask, the questions. Do the kids want the house? Are there family treasures to gift now? Who would be the executor of your will? What about your pets? See, this is a lot of questions and, and learning in, in these four steps before you even touch a document or see an estate planning attorney. And you're going to go through several iterations of this, especially as we age and, and life changes. You know, your kids may have kids and they may have grandkids. You have great great grandkids. These are things that, um, you know, we also don't want stale documents. So if you've already done this, make sure you're updating them along the way. You know, talking about like what the kids want. Richard and I see this often where, you know, most people always assume that the kids want their home. I can tell you like 99% of the time, that's not the case. Unless it's on a, you know, on the beach, on a river, in the mountains. Usually, you know, you guys pass, those homes are gone. And so have that conversation up front to make sure it's something that they actually want. Um, and, you know, one thing I can remember my grandmother did when I was young, and I'm not sure if this was right or wrong because we were pretty little, but she'd go through and ask everybody in the family, she'd assign us a sticker, like you were doing a big community garage sale. And, you know, like I had a blue sticker, my cousins would have a, a yellow or a red and put it on the back of things that we wanted. And so they took that into uh, account Let's say we're updating documents. So that conversation was had even at a younger age. So when when they both passed, it made you know, there were there was not the big uh, riff like Rich just mentioned, where people are fighting. And we see that often as well, because most of these things have never been communicated. So pretty, uh, you know, really good sound advice, Rich. So the communication ideas, I think this is one of the more difficult aspects of this. Nobody wants to talk about debt. You know, we see that the majority of uh, procrastination around financial planning really lies within the estate plan, life insurance and estate planning documents. And like you mentioned earlier, Rich, most people don't want to execute or act on any of these until they get in that situation where they feel like they need it. Long-term care, usually once they've had a family member actually need it or use a policy is when a lot of times we hear from people like, hey, we need to look at this. Same thing with the estate planning documents. But I love how you, you, you really focus on make it a celebration dinner. Get people together, have open conversations with this. Uh, so important. And then finding a facilitator who can actually help if you're uncomfortable doing this yourself, having a mediator, so to speak, somebody that you trust, somebody that you work with potentially, another loved one, to start broaching that conversation. And the sooner you do this stuff, the better, because we don't want to do this you know, way too late. It's like somebody that needs a power of attorney as they, you know, they have onset dementia that happened quickly. It's typically too late. So um, these are really good points, Rich. And I know you, you had to throw the pets in here. I just see too many pets that are shell-shocked 
when their owners died and uh, owner elderly owners die and the elderly owners just assume that the kids want the pet. They don't want the house and some of them don't want the pet. Um, so it breaks my heart to see that, you know, uh, so, you know, the celebration part is part of the rethinking and rewiring your brain process of so the people that, and a lot of time I see this around holiday time, um, a special Thanksgiving dinner, um, to, to have this conversation and the kids are like, Oh my God. And I was at one of these dinners and, uh, <laughs> The kids were like, oh my gosh, are we really going to talk about that now? And I, I sort of became the facilitator and said, yeah, I think it's important. This is a gratitude exercise, right? And we want to go through this and then we can go on. We don't have to spend a lot of time, but you want to start. In other words, Adam, like maybe you with your mom, like with my dad and mom, I never felt like they wanted to talk to me about it. Like I asked a few times and they were just like, you're my kid and you're an idiot. So that's an Italian family. They do that. That's a sign of love. Uh, no matter how old you are, you're still little and you still need to be potty trained. It doesn't matter. So, you know, that once you start having this exercise of dinner celebration and talking the, the 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 muscle flexes and you begin to be more open communication you know your team doesn't have to be just somebody who's a financial advisor it could be but yeah it's, i mean as far as that team goes your financial advisor but it's your estate planning attorney or your attorney who's drafting the documents but the facilitator can help and that could just even be a really good friend it could be someone in the family who's always been like i have one Clients that does this, they they were cousins growing up, and that that they she always has her there for moral support, and and again, don't forget certain things like your pets, because again, you make assumptions about things, and it just replace Muffy with anything else. You're making an assumption. Do not assume your children or your loved ones know your intentions, and again, don't let the cold dead documents speak for you. You speak for you. Dead documents are nothing compared to living words. And that's why we, you know, there's a lot of, there's a thousand communication ideas. We're just giving you sort of things that we've seen work so that you can uh, take them to heart. Yeah, if I can just underscore a few things you just said there, Richard. Um, one about speak for yourself, not let dead documents speak for yourself. Like it was amazing just the difference between, you know, the, the last day my mom was, was conscious and then the day after, where all of a sudden there were things that my brother and I, I think, just sort of naturally assumed that we were, you know, we understood about my mom. And, and then the day after, you know, a couple of questions came up where we're like, oh, I don't know. What do you think mom would want to have done in this case? And I thought one thing and he thought the other. And we're like, oh, my God, we, we just could have asked her yesterday. Right. So, you know, once once you don't have the opportunity to do that, you know, uncertainty creeps in. Um really important here, and I'm a bit biased because my wife is a therapist, um, but this point about considering a facilitator, I, I don't think can be uh, underscored enough. Um, so much of the reason why people don't have these discussions is because naturally humans don't like confrontation. Um, generally, people don't like focusing on their own mortality or in the mortality of the people that they love. So there's a lot of avoidance that goes on, right? Just, just to begin with, under the best of scenarios. But a lot of these topics can be pretty emotionally charged. Um, one for those reasons that I mentioned, but also reasons because, you know, the kids might not always agree with what the parents want to do, right? Or the, the, you know, you're giving this to my my brother and I'm not getting it, right? That you you begin to kind of have those reactions, and you need to have somebody who's skilled in kind of, you know, peacemaking, letting every party have their voice, helping people understand each other's points of view defusing the situation when emotions get too high and whatnot. So I, I really can't underscore enough having a good facilitator. And, and I personally would say, yeah, if, if there's nobody else, you know, bring in a good family friend who kind of knows everybody, but but that's can oftentimes not be that that person's not necessarily trained to be a facilitator. And it puts them sometimes in a really awkward position because they're getting squeezed amongst friends. So I would highly say if 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 you've got conversations that aren't going well, I think that's a good sign to maybe reach out to a, a therapist or some other professional facilitator and just say, hey, can we hopefully we only need one session, but can we come in and help you kind of moderate this sticky discussion we're having? Because we need to get to a resolution and we want to try to get to the best one for everybody. So 
Uh, again, can't underscore that enough. And then the last point about the pets, um, back to my mother's case, she had an old diabetic cat uh, that was actually in the process of failing itself. And, you know, in the middle of trying to figure out what to do with my mom, we had to be juggling what to do with this cat that was kind of getting bounced around from neighbor to neighbor. And I lived, you know, on the opposite end of the country and my brother lived several states away. So figuring that all out in the mix too, again, to your point, that was just one of the things that if we had had a plan in advance would have made things so much easier. But this poor cat was a hot potato in the midst of all this chaos. So yes, please give advanced thought to what to do with the pets. Yeah, because then you say to yourself, because I think one of the worst questions you can ask is, what would mom want it? Like, in other words, I had to make the decisions for end of life for my mom and dad. Um, and because they had me no guidance and I had to make an assumption. That's a, that, that. I mean, most kids can handle that, but why put them in their place? Why don't you make the decision now and let them just follow through? Because maybe you make the wrong decision or maybe you made the right decision. You don't know. You know, so that's important. And you see, it all starts from communication, Adam. It all starts from talking. And the older generations, what we, Danny and I have noticed is the more younger the generations, and as you go past the baby boomer, older baby boomers into the younger boomers and the Gen Xs and millennials, the conversations are happening a little bit better, a little bit more. Both husband and wives are engaged. Seeing a little bit more openness as opposed to this stigma uh, around money. And that's pretty positive. Well, that's yeah, good to I, hear again, not, not to make this all about my mom, but, um, I, I just, maybe some, some viewers will hear this in themselves, you know, probably 10 years before she passed away, you know, we sat down with her and just said, Hey, we're concerned because you don't really have much of a plan going forward from here, uh, both to care for yourself while you're still alive, but also, you know, the, 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 your, your, your end of life plans as well. And she just cut it off and she said, yeah, you're asking me if I have a plan. I don't have a plan and I don't want to talk about it. Right. And it was just this sort of like avoidance and stonewalling. And we knew at the time, like, this is not going to help anybody, but we couldn't crack open the conversation. Yeah, Adam, I really like what you mentioned, though, about having a paid facilitator, somebody who's unbiased who can come in. And I know a lot of people are probably balking at paying somebody and the fees associated with it. But I can assure you the minimal amount you would spend on something like that is way, way less than what you spend at the end of life on attorney fees, the, the going back and forth. I mean, it, it would make things so much easier. Right. And the cost of strained, you know, family relationships yeah. that might last the rest of your lives. Yeah. A couple hundred bucks versus that. Oh my God. It's a no brainer. Absolutely. Well, yeah. We see that so often where people just, I mean, yeah, families yeah. completely torn apart and sometimes it's not even over much. I mean, it's, we're talking very little, any little bit amount of money or just sentimental value. It's, uh, it's sad really. And, and sorry to interrupt, but this is an important point to make. Um, in in my family dynamic with a parent that didn't want to face this stuff, what it did, it it, it forced the rest of us in the family to have to kind of get involved when when she kept hitting sort of crisis after crisis because there wasn't a plan. And, and what it did is it put pressure on each of us and it really fractured our relationships in a way that didn't need to happen. Right. So in other words, if there had been a plan, if we had all kind of agreed on what to do and we were all lined up behind doing it, we all would have been in lockstep. But because we were kind of thrown into chaos, um, it, it 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 created what I think was a lot of unnecessary trauma amongst the supporting crew of people. And, you know, it's it's if I can help people avoid that by encouraging them to do what you're saying, uh, I'll do that all day long. Well, and to your point, you've now your mom not realizing it's created friction and that's what you remember and that's the bad part about not communicating and and just saying i can't talk about it and a lot of older generations are like that you take care of it well you know it doesn't work that way because you create rifts in families that never heal and they don't have to be over even as serious as issues as you're talking adam i mean i've got a brother and sister don't talk because of a gi joe with a kung fu grip i mean it's <laughs> I'm talking really silly stuff that you go, eh. you know, so it's so important to go through this process. And if you're working with a financial advisor and this is your financial partner, they shouldn't charge you for doing that. They should all be able to gather in your office and you should be the facilitator. So I don't see any extra expense in the facilitator. If you have a financial advisor you're working with, that just should be part of what the advisor does. 
because the advisor needs to know your estate plan. The advisor wants to know the children. We want to know the, your family. Sometimes we are put in the place of as clients hire executors. They'll have us talk to their kids or I've grown up with, I have, I have picked clients for 28 years. I know their kids. And they'll ask me, do you think Billy is a good executor? And I'm like, no, no, Billy is a terrible executor. Let me give you an idea. Pam, your, your, your daughter would be a better executor. Here's why. So I you know, hate to share this, but that's my job. Right. I'm an outsider. I'm looking at pros and cons and the client in their gut knows, you know what? You're right. I, 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 I knew that. I just needed someone to tell me. So facilitator is so important. Um, who's independent. Yeah, and sorry, and sorry to interrupt, but that's another reason why having kind of a professional or outside party versus a friend, right. because they right. can give you the tough love. Right. Hey, yeah. you know what? Your son, not the right guy for this. Go with the daughter. Yeah. The, yeah, and where, I think that our where, profession, though, has changed so much, too, where it used to be, you know, it was only about stocks and bonds or investing. And now, you know, you can view it almost more as a life coach in many ways. I mean, we've had to, you know, hone up on different certifications. You know, being a fiduciary is really important to us. But, you know, having that full understanding and the concept of full financial planning, what does that actually mean, not just inside a portfolio, but for your, your whole life? And I think that's extremely important when you're talking about looking at professionals having somebody that understands not just one facet of the investment game, but knows about each and every one of them and can pull in specialists when needed. That's another important point Danny's bringing up. Your financial advisor is going to know the specialists to bring in and how to employ them and how to ask them questions. So that's also a very important um, uh, point overall. Okay. And, and gosh, guys, on this, you may have this later in the, the presentation here. Um, but again, that was sort of one of the things I learned going through this process is there actually are lots of different specialists that you're going to have to work with. Um, there's obviously the doctors, right, that are caring for your parent, right? And you're going to find out really quickly that as they get older and have more ailments and issues, that they're going to be all sorts of different types of specialists that they're going to be seeing. And somebody needs to kind of quarterback all of that to stay on top of all the things that, you know, mom or dad is going through health wise. But then there's the, um, you know, there, there are elder care specialists out there that kind of have a real bead on like, what are the resources in your area for seniors, right? So there may be, you know, uh, you know subsidized senior housing, right? As they begin to age and become uh, more infirm, they may qualify for uh, in-home support, someone who can come in a couple days a week, um, you know, do things like buy groceries for them, or maybe even help them shower. Um, there's all these things out there, but uh, the average person has no clue what they are, right? <laughs> so, you know, how do you find out what's out there? And then how do you kind of get a quarterback who can help you piece them all together into a cohesive um, you know, portfolio of, of services, support services for those in your life. There are going to be more and more of those services as we move forward. Uh, it's a very important area uh, as far as this kind of progression planning, um, people that are just going to be doing that and being the facilitator, but also gathering the resources that that individual needs. And there are some services out there now. They're not as prevalent, but they will need to be. And unfortunately, without communication, it falls on the family, uh, like it did for you, Adam, and your family. So, so Adam, we don't necessarily get into the nitty gritty of like the individual specialist for each one, but we're going to talk a lot about you know what to look for, types of documents needed, and that could be a completely separate webinar, really. I mean, because we could spend so much time on this. Honestly, this could be hours long, if you know, getting into quite a bit of detail with this. All right, great. Well, at the end of this, uh, for any areas that you feel are kind of, you know, potentially deserve a deeper dive, we can pull folks in the in the comments and say, hey, do you want us to do another one of these on any of these topics? And folks can tell us if they'd like us to. Perfect. We'd love to help. So getting into kind of that next realm or discussion, you know, the documents, right? This is what most people think about. I mean, all the things that Richard just discussed, these are all the things that lead up to actually making the documents and getting to the point where you're working with an estate planner, with your advisor, with people that you're going to determine what exactly is needed. And so too often, I think we put the cart before the horse and we just say, all right, let's go get the documents done. 
and then they open up a lot of a lot of questions that we're just not prepared to to answer. And so I think once we have those questions answered, that we've had the discussion with family, we kind of had a facilitator, then you can get to the documentation part of this. And so these are the basics. Rich, why don't you go through each one of these and kind of just, you know, what's important yeah. with each and I mean, how you would use each one? Yeah, just highlights. You know, uh, last will and testament is pretty basic. I mean, most people have heard of these, right? You can, most important part of this, um, and you want it, you can meet with an estate planner to do it. Uh, of course, board certified. Listen, attorneys do these things, but find someone who's board certified from estate planning, not a generalist. I, I would recommend an estate planning specialist, right? Um, you got to think about your guardians for children. I have clients who have, are young and they have children and they fight or they can't figure out who the guardian is going to be. And I'm like, if you don't select the guardian, the state will do it for you. This is not what you want to do. So naming executors, naming guardians for your minor children, who cares for your pets? Um, these are things that you need to do in a last will and testament. Who's driving the bus? When you go, you don't want the state driving it. You drive it, right? Then beneficiary designations, right? You have IRAs, 401k, Roth accounts. Make sure your beneficiaries are up to date. Those assets do not need probate, but go through those beneficiaries, add them, or your estate planner will say, listen, you need to do your beneficiaries, but you also need to set up contingent beneficiaries. Here's the document. Here's what you need to do. Financial power of attorneys. Adam, you probably were alluding to this, like if mom needed someone to pay her bills temporarily, or she was, she had an end of life, you know, she might be incapacitated. What is, what is, what are her wishes? Who's the person taking care of those wishes? That was where the power of attorneys fit into play. Yeah. And just to make folks, help folks understand the importance of a financial power of attorney, which we didn't really appreciate until the end there is... So let's say they're incapacitated, but they have expenses they need to pay. You can't get access to their bank accounts or anything like that unless you have financial power of attorney, right? Um, I'd also assume in here too, you'd also want medical power of attorney. Um, so again, if they're incapacitated, you can speak on their behalf with the, the, the team of doctors that are working with them. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about a document going forward that can help. And you can see oh, this. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> hey, Danny, can you go back for one second here? Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, I just want to ask a couple of questions around this. Um, so there's there's also there's, there's having a will, right? And then there's having a trust for your assets, right? Can you guys just talk um, specifically about the difference and when people should think of one? And, and, and let me tell you what I was told, and you can tell me if this is correct or not. Which is in most cases, if you have substantial assets, you want to put them in a trust so that they will avoid probate. And maybe you guys can just tell people the 30 second definition of what probate is and why you'd like to avoid it if you can. Um, the will is, is mostly for specifying things. It's most important for specifying guardianship of your kids if you die while you still have minors. Um, but it's also the place where you can say, look, I want the, the China to go to Susan and I want my GI Joe with the Kung Fu grip to go to Barry, right? <laughs> um, but in general, you, you don't, if you've got a number of assets, you probably don't just want to have a will, you probably want to have as many of those as can go into the trust. So because if, if you don't have the trust, everything gets put into probate, correct? Yeah, there's a handful of ways that you can go about that you can have what you call a pour over provision and create a testamentary trust upon your passing. And that's one way where assets outside of that will pour into the trust. Once you pass, there's a handful of ways that you can go about this. And in different states, there will be different laws or other provisions and types of vehicles you may want to consider. Some of our clients use limited partnerships um, that can conceal assets. And it's for, we can also condense assets for estate planning from estate taxes down the road, right? State and federal. So we can go, these are the basics of what you need. But essentially probates, when you have to go before the court, they're going to make sure that your will, you know, hopefully you have one. And they're going to say, okay, your executor is, is this person. They're going to go through everything, check off on it and say, okay, guys, you're good to go. Death certificates get issued uh, prior to that typically. And then they have the ability to actually go out and act on the behalf of the estate. Um, yeah. If you right. have a beneficiary designation, that will supersede, that goes outside of probate. So 
If I pass and Richard was my beneficiary, Richard would be able to go in with my death certificate, show that to the custodian or the bank, whoever it may be, get the assets that are that he's entitled to, right? So there's ways that there's a couple of different ways that you can go about this. These are really just the basics. Okay. And and real quick, one of the purposes of probate is to allow anybody that has a claim against your estate to be able right. to petition right. for that claim um, before the, the beneficiaries it. get a thing. Pardon me? Right. But they can contest it. But keep this in mind. So not everybody needs a trust. A trust can be revocable. That means like you can have the Adam Taggart revocable living trust. That's your social security number as the tax ID. It'll spell out your what the will will spell out. But the difference will be um, it's private. It's private. It Probate gets into court. Do you want a lot of movie stars do revocable living trust because they don't want you to see what's in their estate, right? Okay. So and because it's because private, it's private, it, because if it's not in a trust, it becomes public, and so people get to see all the assets you have upon right. your death. Right. Yeah, and then uh, now some states are easy for probate, like Texas. Some states like California, right? You might need to buy a new pair of shoes before the your estate plan is done. I mean, that takes a long time in certain states like New York. And it's expensive. It could be one to four percent of your estate. So some people say, I don't want to go through that process. I just don't want my children to. It's easier for me to do that. And to Danny's point, where a other trusts come into play, testamentary, that there's a trust that spawns out of your will or revocable living trust becomes irrevocable. That where you want to do this is you you have substantial assets and it has nothing to do with estate tax exemptions. But I have a daughter and I say, I want all my money to go to my daughter in trust. Now, why I do that is not because I'm a billionaire. It's because I don't want those assets attached. I want my daughter, Haley, if she gets divorced, anything happens to her, uh, to, to a relationship she's having or whatever, this money stays within the family. So trust can protect that money to remain in the family, whether it's $100,000 or $100 yeah. million. Yeah. It's control from beyond the grave, but it's control for the family. So testamentary trust, you don't need a lot of fancy trust, perhaps when you're alive, the will can spawn these trusts as well. So that's, that's where I really like the trust, Adam, is that you can control the funds beyond the grave. And essentially, if you said, okay, I want my kids to get these assets, as long as they remain in that trust, they can still have access to them. Now, you can also put some stipulations. I mean, you can put, you know, Lance jokes that he put stipulations that they have to marry a Catholic, they have to take a drug test if necessary, yeah. they have to, you know, go on down the list, right? You can get very specific. But most people will say, okay, at 30, you can become co-trustee. So they're going to be sitting in on meetings. They can't make decisions on their own, but they start to get a very good understanding as far as the inner workings of it. What are the things they need to be uh, considering? And then maybe at 35 or 40, they can become trustee of the account themselves. But in the interim, you can do it where a lot of people say it's him. You can you can take into account the hymns is what they call. It. So health, education, maintenance, and support. So, you know, if you pass away, the kids are still in college. They have access to this for justifiable needs. They can't go out and buy a sh shiny yellow Corvette or Ferrari. Right. But, you know, within, within the means of the trust. And this is a really good good way to protect the assets. And what what Richard mentioned earlier, I think is extremely important because I can't tell you how many times we've seen assets passed down that aren't in a trust. Somebody gets divorced and now they're considered marital property or community property in a community property state and they get split in half. And so by keeping the funds within a trust, you can avoid that. All right, great point. And guys, I, I know that there's there's an awful lot of nuance to this topic. Um, so, you know, I don't want to hijack the whole presentation just on the topic of trusts and estate planning. But um, I think it's important that we let people know that it's important to consider these things because they do offer a lot of advantages. So I they imagine if you've, got, if you've got assets, your advice would be go see an estate planner, you know, an estate law attorney to figure out what the right vehicle is for what you're trying to do. And I, I guess I would just, in addition to that, if, if someone is is just starting out, maybe doesn't even know a good estate attorney yet, whatnot, a good next step would be to talk to your financial advisor and say, hey, can you be my guide here? Yeah, a good financial advisor will give you general education about this stuff. And to your point, trusts sound great. Like, you know, it's a great word, trust. 
right? But I mean, I need it. Um, my They're daughter, is, yeah, my daughter's 25. She's a PhD candidate at Emory. I'm okay with her handling her own trust. And if I want it to be a testamentary, it's, it's her trust. She's the trustee. She can spend the money however she wants, right? You also have to know the money you're leaving leaving for your family and whether they're, they would be good financial stewards of it. But I do it for protection of her. As she, if she gets divorced, then that money's not attached. Um, I don't have a revocable living trust, but I have been considering it because I just don't want my stuff out there. So there are reasons to do these things, but don't rush out to do it. Do the basics first, then you can worry about the nuances. Worry about where the estate tax exemptions are going to go. If they drop below a certain level, then you might be going back to what we call good old fashioned AB trust, exemption preservation. Right now, not many people are going to fall into the massive estate tax exemptions. So these are the basics. But to your point, Adam, it could change and trust become more important. In the 90s, trusts were really important when the estate tax exemption was 500 to 650,000 each. A lot of people wanted to do that to preserve exemptions. So trust planning is not as prevalent, but it could be really important uh, in the future. All right. You, you raise a good point, and this is the last point I'll make, and I'll let you move on to the presentation. But as you said earlier, you, you don't when you put together the documents that you've been talking about, you guys kept saying you want to revisit them, right? Because things evolve inside of a family, right? People get born, need to be added, things happen, and you might change your mind. And you know, you, so you want to be revisiting it on a regular basis for the human side of it. But I also hear you saying you'll want to revisit the mechanics and logistics of your progression planning regularly too, because the external environment is constantly changing, right? The 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 laws around trusts is a good example, right? If a really you... good estate planner will communicate with clients. Unfortunately, a lot of estate planners or attorneys in general is transactional in nature. So they just get something done, they move on and they don't think of you again. But a really good estate planner, we know we know many of them, they will actually communicate and say, hey, these laws are changing. Here's new legislation. Here's things we need to be considering. You may fall into this. Let's schedule some time to visit to see if we need to restructure anything that you have. And I think that's so important because not only is, you know, families change, family dynamics, we may want to change things within the will or in the or in a trust, but we really have to keep up to the up to speed with what's going on in legislation. Because so often we see a lot of people that pass, they may have trusts that were designed 20, 30 years ago where state tax exemptions were, you know, really, really low. And now you can see they're outdated. They don't make as much sense. Sometimes they don't make as much sense to the beneficiaries now. So I think, you know, keeping up to speed with this is really, really important. And if we don't think taxes are going higher, we're going to be told ourselves another story yeah. because <laughs> we know what things look like. And the estate plan and legacy taxes are just always on the radar and you never know. So paying attention to the external environment in today's times is absolutely crucial. All right, good. We're glad we got that point across. All right, sorry to have hijacked this. No, feel free to go, go into the Thanks, next slide. Adam. I think we're still doing documents here to scare. Yeah, everybody. no, we, we do have some more documents to get to, but you know, we didn't talk about the pet trust. I mean, you did allude to it yeah. earlier. There's some ways that you can do that as well to make sure the pet's cared for. So really controlling the decisions beyond the grave, another great avenue or asset to do that as well. I, I have a pet trust. I have three dogs. I know where they go. I know how much money I've allotted to take care of them. So, you know, pets are very important. Um, so you want to make sure. And again, you could just stipulate in your will. You don't need a special pet trust. Yeah, you can do an yeah. addendum to the will. You, you can do an addendum. Pets, but just right. to give you an idea with throw, keeping the pets like mom's cat. Poor mom's cat, if she would have wound up in a shelter, she'd have been, you know. Mom wouldn't have liked that, I'm pretty sure. So. No, what would a mom done? Mom wouldn't have put her in a shelter. So these things say, what about, you know, Adam may not want the, the, the cat, but Adam may take the cat with a $10,000 stipend to take care of the cat and keep the cat comfortable until the cat passes away. Mom would have liked that. Yep. Yeah, and, you know, I mentioned an addendum. You may not even need that if you don't name specifically each pet within the will. You just put my dogs, my cats, whatever, made, my goldfish, whatever it is. And so and so would take care of it in lieu of them. Here's the next person. And then here's they go to this shelter or charity or whatever it may be after that. So there's easy ways to do this. 
So next documents, Adam, you alluded to the durable medical power of attorney. So important. You mentioned when somebody gets incapacitated, you're paying bills for your mother. Same thing with this, right? Being able to make decisions um, while somebody's still here, but needs help having access to, you know, doctors, hospital bills, all the HIPAA things that we typically would not be able to get access to. This is really nice and make sure it's a part of your, your package when you're doing an estate plan. Yeah, and sorry to interrupt. Just to mention on this from my recent experience, um, my mom was still pretty lucid, you know, up until the end. Um, but she just didn't want to have to deal with all the decisions that had to be made. And so a lot of times she would just defer to my brother and I to say, hey, can you guys just work with the doctors to figure it out? We always had to show beforehand that we had the power of attorney documentation before the doctors would engage with us on this. So my point is, is the person doesn't even need to be incapacitated. They just might not want to deal with it. But if they don't, if they want to pass that baton to you to make the decisions for them, you have to have this document for the doctors to listen to you. Correct. Yeah. That's why the living will is so important as well, because hopefully then you don't have to make the decisions for them. They've already been outlined. They've given you a pretty good directive or marching orders as far as what they would want done, which goes into the DNR, do not resuscitate type of forms as well. Yeah. And again, that's just one of those things I think is a kindness, right? Rather than make your kids in the heat of the moment decide whether to pull the plug or not, right? You've already specified the conditions under when you want that to happen and you're taking that burden off of them. Listen, that's a big toll. Like I mentioned earlier, I had to do that and I was happy to do it. And I think I would have known what my parents wanted, but it would have been nice for them to let me know if that that's what they want. Yeah. So don't put that on your kid's shoulders or someone in your family. You may had a hard story. time doing that with a dog, with a pet, much less like, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't even want to imagine having I, to make that decision think, on my own for a parent think, or a loved one. I, but. Yeah, I think Mrs. Ratlett's pulling the plug real fast. So, oh, man, think. no doubt. Yeah, because she knows about the life insurance. Because she knows about that life insurance. <laughs> yeah. That plug, that plug's not even in. Um, oh, it's gone. So, she flipped the, the breaker of the hospital. Important. We're done. Some people even have small policies on life insurance just to pay for burial expenses or they, you know, clients do their own burial expenses. You know, I'm over there thinking about, oh, look at that vista above Johnny Cash's grave. I think I'll take care of my own. I'm going to take care of my own burial expenses. And my girlfriend goes, why are we doing that now? Uh, yeah, but, you know, I talk about this stuff all day. I can talk about it to a lot of people without it affecting me. I'm going to die. I want to prepare for it. I want to make sure the people around me that I love life insurance can make things easier. As you get older, you may not need it, but some people keep it just to pay for end of life expenses. Hey, let, let me ask this. Let's say somebody is watching this and they are, you know, they're older, right? And and they're maybe not particularly well, um, but they'd like to have some life insurance to be able to do what you guys were just talking about. Now, of course, life insurance gets a lot more expensive the older and, and less healthy you are. Um, is is there a threshold at where it just doesn't make sense? Or are there different types where even if you are older and, and not in the best of health, um, you can still, the economics still work out enough to get it? Depends on the amount, I think. Also, you always see these commercials from like all these companies on TV, because I watch all the stations a lot of older people watch, like I'm watching the Westerns and there's burial insurance, like, oh, you can get up to like $10,000 worth of life insurance, no evidence of insurability and it'll cost this amount. It's very expensive. So you got to add, you just got to organize the cost. The point is that it might be just, it's the, if you want a burial, it might be ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. You might be able to get that and pay for it. But there are other programs. You actually can even work with a funeral park or, or cemetery to come up with a payment plan to take care of it. If that's what you want to do. But yeah, yeah, you know, after 65 years old, 66 years old, term insurance is not it's going to be cost prohibitive. And why would I want whole life? I'm not going to I'm not going to live long enough to build cash value. So there's a point where life insurance doesn't work. But we have a lot of people who have policies for years and they're still paying on them and they're not big. Fifty thousand, forty thousand. They're like, should we get rid of this? I'm like, well, you can't afford to pay your own burial expenses, but do you just want to make it even easier and keep it. So this might be more of. Do I keep the insurance I have already versus buy new? In many okay, and, and I know that insurance is a, a big topic in and of itself. And, and maybe folks watching, this is one of those times where I'll say, let us know in the comment section your level of interest here. But um, uh, 
you know, there's a number of people watching right now, too, that are in the sandwich generation that Danny was talking about, right, that are caring for their older folks, but thinking ahead. You know, there may be decisions you can make in your 40s and 50s, maybe even early 60s around insurance, uh, where you could be setting things up to leave a fair amount of money behind uh, through insurance, not just to cover burial stuff, but to actually leave, you know, a nice inheritance for somebody. I think about, I mean, I deal with it all the time. I deal with 60 year olds who are married and have new families. They have 30 year old wives, 35, they have new kids, right? They all of a sudden we're buying life insurance again. I mean, yeah, life insurance is an evolving process depending upon how culture goes, families go. This in the strict sense of burial and pay for expenses, you may or may not need it. Yeah, so, so like a term life insurance policy, we look at that generally to mitigate risk. So if you have little ones at home, something you pass early, you want you know your spouse to be able to continue the lifestyle they've had, you want to pay for college, um, set up for retirement even. So those are the main things for like a term policy. And when we see it get super expensive is when somebody ages, maybe they have a one-year renewability policy after it's actually expired. Say you had a 20 or 30-year term. And at that point, that's when it becomes, okay, well, how old are you now? What's your life expectancy? What type of health are you in? And then you can kind of see what the numbers were. But where a permanent policy would come in, and, and Rich alluded to that, you typically wouldn't want to do that, you know, unless it's for an estate planning purpose when we're older, because it's a lot more expensive. Um, but there's ways, there's a handful of ways to look at insurance. I think that all of them can play, a, they can all be a tool in, in the toolbox. You just have to know when to use them. And yeah. is, it, you know, is, is it fair to say there are some options later in life uh, that you should discuss with your financial advisor and what might make sense for you? But the earlier in life you can put life insurance to work for you, the more options and, and perhaps oh, absolutely. bigger, bigger. Well, yeah, because now we're talking in. about the, the living benefit, but there are a lot of firms that will do these burial policies that yep. you may want to talk to your financial advisor about. Um, there's a company called like True Stage. There are a few others that say you can get up to $20,000, no evidence of insurability. So if you just need money to make sure your kids have enough to take care of your last wishes, then in the scope of this topic, life insurance uh, can can work. But okay. most people have some of the cash to take care of it, do their own assets. But if they want to preserve, I have one client, she's got $100,000 estate. She wants to leave it to her granddaughter. I think it's very admirable that she's doing that. And she says, listen, I, you know, I would like to make sure I cover my own expenses. So she did buy one of these policies. In essence, it's sort of expensive, but it fits within her budget and the price never goes up. So she was willing to do it. She's 79 years old and she bought $20,000 worth of life insurance just to take care of her burial with the funeral parlor. Yeah. Oh, and again, I, I I think that's another great thing, sort of like the living will, that if you can just take care of that, you know, in advance for your heirs, that's awesome. I'll just say last point on this with my mom, who was living on, you know, a very small budget. We found out at one point that she was paying, you know, a certain amount of money every month towards burial, burial insurance. And um, I think it was going to pay for like $10,000 worth of, you know, burial expenses or something like that. And when we talked to her and we said, hey, you know, OK, so what do you want in terms of, you know, your your burial? And she just said, well, I just want to be cremated. And we were like, oh, well, that costs like twelve hundred bucks. So, you know, basically she's putting more away for the insurance and it's actually going to cost us out of pocket at the end of the day. So we said, hey, you know what? Why don't you stop paying that? You can have that additional cash flow every month and we'll just take care of the cremation at the end. That's why you got to work backwards, Adam. You got to reanalyze in this in this progression planning. What do I want? Like for me, it was being cremated in this little niche in this tiny in this cemetery in Tennessee. And how much? I went and I talked to the person at the funeral parlor. Said, "Here's how much it costs." Right. So then I work backwards. I know the cost. Now, how do I pay for it? So I don't overpay for burial insurance. Right. So yeah, agree. You got it. And that's where it all stems from this communication, right? Absolutely. I mean, everything we're talking about here is starts with back and forth communication with people you love and professionals. And until you get over the fact that, oh my God, this is terrible, this is morbid, and reframe it in your mind, you're not going to get past to any of this stuff.
All right, so let's talk about those last assets or documents or digital assets. I think this is one thing that's so often overlooked when somebody passes, they don't have a playbook to say, hey, how do I get into these accounts? Where do we find things? Where are different types of accounts? I think this is one thing that we could really help each other with, with loved ones, because how often do you know, Rich, as somebody who's passed and the spouse has no idea where 90% of their assets are? Because one's been the the kind of the financial decision maker, they've done all the work. And so we always encourage people to get involved. And I think you can create a playbook with all of these documents here and really, you know, decide, hey, where are my accounts? Here's the passwords. Here's how you access them. Here's who you need to talk to. Um, we like taking an inventory of assets within financial plans. So our clients can come to us and say, hey, I can't remember where everything is. Where would we go? And so that's a that's a one really good step. But I think writing this out or having this in a safe place. And Rich, you mentioned some uh, in a minute some places that people can actually go to to memorialize this, so to speak. And only certain people can get access to it. And it's still encrypted and protected, which I think is really important. But also the funeral instructions, kind of like you mentioned, Adam, with your mother, you know, paying for that policy for something that was probably going to cost a lot more than what she really needed. And at the end of the day, it came down to cash flow. So having those instructions on funeral instructions, burial arrangements, I've even seen people go so far as I want to have these songs, these hymns done at my funeral. I want a party afterwards. Uh, everybody gets together. And so where you really have your personal touch on it. And I think that is that is awesome. And probably the best experiences for the loved ones as well. Absolutely. I know Richard, you're going to chime in here, but but again, just having gone through that, um, Yes, on that last point, um, we we fortunately had the time to really talk about like the ceremony of life and all that stuff. And my mom was one of those people who definitely wanted a party, didn't want people to be sad. And so it was super helpful for us to know exactly what she wanted. So we just we just basically followed the recipe and we felt really good, like, oh, great, this is what mom said she wanted, right? Um, to your point on the digital assets, just two things to underscore there. Um, wasn't the case with my mom, but but because I've been referring people over to you guys for so long. You know, I've heard many, many stories of spouses um, and usually, uh, you know, usually wives where it was the husband who did all of the money stuff, right? And then when he suddenly passed away unexpectedly, they had no clue where anything was. I mean, they, they didn't even know where it was. Like, I don't know what bank it's at. I don't know what brokerage firms it's at. Uh, but even if they did, they didn't know where the files were and they didn't know what the passwords were, right? And so it's just this horrendously complicated jungle to navigate at a time where they're very emotionally, uh, you know, upset. Um, but I'll tell you, we didn't have to deal with that with my mom because she didn't have assets. Um, but the digital assets she did have that we really wished we had gotten on top of sooner was just like her personal life asset. So just like we had to figure out where the key to her mailbox was at her place and get access to that and collect her old mail and you know tell the post office not to send it there anymore. Well, there's her email account, right? There's her Facebook account. Um, there's her, you know, text was, was, even though she was 80, she did a fair amount of texting, right? And uh, not only do we not know what the passwords for those accounts were, and we eventually kind of tracked down most of them, but then we needed to get the passwords for the devices that she had. <laughs> we couldn't yeah. even get into them because we didn't know what the device password. So like all this stuff, I, I mean, it was literally like the day after she passed away, there were several of these things where we were like, oh my God, why didn't we ask this question yesterday when she was still here? This is more prevalent, I think, for younger generations that, listen, I don't like paper. I don't want any statements. I don't want any of that. But I have logins to my insurance and all that, right? So if I want them in one place, I can physically write them out, or I could keep them in a digital vault and give my daughter access to the and my executor access to the digital vault. So when I'm gone, you go right into the digital vault, you'll have access to everything that I have as far as passwords. I think it's right. a great idea. Do, do many people do that? Because that's a great pre best practice. Not as many as they should. Not as many as they should. Um, but I think with these younger generations that are pretty much online, they're going to do it. And it is growing in in popularity. I see more people write them out than probably use it digitally. Yeah. But I do think it is growing in popularity. Um, and also going back to your point earlier about how typically one spouse being involved and not the other, we have clients that, that really... They manage their own funds. They're very smart. They say, listen, we like what you guys do, how you do it. 
and they they at some point say, I need to hang it up, but I also need somebody that I can trust. So my wife is engaged. My wife knows who to go to so that somebody's a point man to say, hey, here's where things are. Here's who we need to communicate with. Here's the attorney. Here's where your funds are. Here's how things are managed. Here's what we've done. And here's why we have done them. But then we bring them in while everybody's still here and build that relationship so that they really understand, you know, what's going on before all this happens. And then you're not skipping a beat in, in many ways. You know, you don't have to go reinvent the wheel. It's already been done prior to the past. Yeah, I'm going to underscore that again, just from experience here, where there's a lot of people that watch this program who are like you described, right? They're very DIY investors mm -hmm. and they're highly capable. And yeah, you know, more power to you, manage your, your assets how, how best you want. You should do that. The challenge is, is that their family members aren't as engaged as they are, right? And they want to pass everything as seamlessly as possible onto their, their family when they pass. Um, but the family isn't necessarily prepared for that, right? So a lot of these DIY people say, well, I, I don't, why would I want to talk to a financial advisor? I'm doing all the work myself. The answer is exactly what you just said there, Danny, which is like, hey, you know, you're know, you not going to be around forever and nobody knows for sure. You might get hit by that proverbial bus tomorrow. You want to have somebody who can provide that bridge, who understands your philosophy, how you want your money managed and can help your sp spouse and or progeny not skip a beat by saying, okay, great. You know, we've, we've been in conversation with your family now for a while. The, the, the main, you know, DIY guy, he's been doing the money, but we've been in touch so that now that he's gone, we can step in and, you know, follow a similar strategy that he was, and we can answer all your questions and customize, you know, this plan any way you remaining folks like but it's not just getting dumped in your lap for you to figure out. I've just right. seen that happen way too often. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. Always good to have everybody on the same page. So next one, next slide we have is talking about the resources. So you mentioned um, Digital Vault. It's going to talk a little bit about that. But Rich, you really like Five Wishes. Why don't we talk a little bit about that first? Yeah, so Five Wishes is a document, and in some states it is legally valid, but it allows you as to write out. It's a little booklet, and you go to fivewishes.org, and you purchase the documents, five bucks online, but I assume we're completed online, but it goes through the personal, the spiritual, the medical, and legal wishes all in one document. Even it goes to the point where you can write out your own eulogy. So it's a workbook. It's a workbook. Um, I've been using these for well over a decade. And if it's a good document to at least do first and start, get those feelings out on paper so that you can share those with your estate planning attorney. And in some states where it's legal with your executor and your loved one. So this five wishes template is really great. Um, and I've been using it for a very long time. So check that out at fivewishes.org. All right. And when uh, you say it's legally valid, like can this serve as a will in certain states? It serves to take care of all those personal and legal wishes that you have. Yeah. So wow, you, okay, great. It, you get it notarized. Um, I still would do estate planning documents. That yeah. I wouldn't use this as that, but I would use this as a template. But if you did want to, you could. Adam, and ideally, this would be used as kind of that conversation starter, like we talked about at the beginning right. earlier. Got it. Yeah, um, it's like the onboard to the correct the formal. Get you thinking yeah. before you go see the attorney, before you start putting everything on, you know, legal documents. Great. And Hospice Association Foundation, listen through that site. Um, you get a lot of information through HFA on data not just for hospice, but it's a really great foundation of data. Um, resources for caregivers. Many of us have become caregivers. Um, going through reading that stuff is really important. And then the digital vaults. After vault is one of them. I just, it's one of the largest and you can organize your information by categories, investment and bank accounts, social media, all of that. And uh, the company will open the vault when you pass to designated recipients after their due diligence, $9.99 a month, 69 bucks a year. And I think as younger generations embrace online more than anything else, these kinds of services are going to be more important. They may not be as important to some of our older individuals who might just write those out, but going forward, I think the digital vaults are going to be really important. 
Yeah, I actually just wrote this down and I'm just thinking for my wife. I mean, she's very digitally facile as am I, but um, I, I do the majority of, of our account maintenance. And, uh, you know, one of the things that just happens all the time is, you know, passwords change, right? You log in and it says, oh, it's been six months. You got to upgrade your password. You don't necessarily, every time that happens to you, remember or think to go change it on some, you know, written document somewhere or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so having all that stuff up to date in some vault that all I need to know is, hey, when I'm gone, my wife can just unlock that and she has everything. Or if we die in a plane crash together, our kids can go and have the executor can have access to everything. That's really valuable. Yes. All right, you're uh, here. <laughs> overall, it's a great site um, that you could take a look at and it'll give you the ability to have this, this vault. And to your point, like if, and I think like our generations, Adam, we're, we're around the same age that we're more receptive to using digital. But it's really neat. They have checklists at After Vault. They have um, the categories you can set up and, you know, a lot of good resources. One, what you need to know if you're creating a living trust or a living will, uh, you know, all this stuff. And what to store in crisis situations. They have a lot of resources at After Vault. It's one of the bigger ones. So, you know, this, this process takes some homework. You know, it's just not on your financial advisor or someone else. You need to go ahead and go forward and do this homework. But once you get it set up, you know, you'll feel really good. So we just yeah. want to make some resources available. I, to under I, I would think that if you were like, if you were a recent retiree, this would be one of the things that you just want to have this whole end of life planning, progression planning we've been talking about. You would just want to have as kind of like your new job for the first couple of weeks afterwards, right? Like, Hey, you're retired. You've got nothing but time at this point in time. Like use, have this be your job for a little while. Like just get all this stuff in order so that you can then put it behind you, have peace of mind, have your family taken care of. And now you can really focus on the fun parts of retirement. Hey, can you head back just for one second? Cause I, I do want to make one more comment about hospice. Um, I didn't really know all that much about hospice until this recent experience with my mother and for better or worse, our experience with hospice was was limited to only about a week, um, uh, and it was a it was a phenomenally positive experience for us. I mean, I, it it really was the element in my mom's passing that uh, just made it so graceful and 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 so much more peaceful and organized and and easy for my family. And it was not part of the plan going into this process at all. It wasn't even on my radar really necessarily. And there are different types of hospice. Um, she went to a, 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 a hospice center. In fact, it was the first one that was ever built in, in, in the country, had the distinction of being the oldest one in the country. Um, but of course there's in-home hospice and a lot of hospitals will have a hospice wing as well. Um, uh, all I can say is, is it's, if, if you have access to good hospice services, um, it can be a complete and total game changer. Um, and I highly, highly recommend putting in the advance work to sort of identify the hospice resources that are available in your area or in your loved one's area. And at least just getting a sense of, okay, when it becomes time to think about hospice, we've kind of already identified the solutions that we want to work with. Um, it'll save you a lot of time. It'll save you a lot of uncertainty. And in certain cases, like in our case, this place that, that my mother was able to go to, uh, a multi-million dollar facility right on the, the Connecticut coastline, right on Long Island Sound. It was like out of a movie set. I mean, it was just beautiful. It happened to be just a block from where my mom had lived at one point in her life. So she had a lot of great memories with that exact beach that this place was on. Um, this facility, I mean, must have been, I don't know, $20, $30 million facility on an amazing piece of land. The staff there, there were probably like 40 staff members. There were seven hospice uh, patients there at the time my mom was there. So she had her private room right overlooking Long Island Sound. She was treated like a queen. You know, she, the, you know, one of the first things the doctor did was write her a prescription for a glass of wine, right? Their job is just to make you as relaxed and pain-free and happy as possible. It was uh, such a godsend. And like I said, it yeah. wasn't on my radar. And, and at first, when that particular option came up and I was 
told about it, we sort of dismissed it in the heat of the moment and said, ah, that's probably not the right thing. Thank God we went and checked it out because again, it made all the difference in the quality of my mom's last couple of days. So I just I just want to underscore if, if hospice is something you're not familiar with, learn about the services and try to figure out how you want to put it in your plan because it can be an amazing resource. Yeah. I mean, like when my dad was, he was passing away at home and he was going through the dying process and I was totally distraught. The hospice person there explained to me each process, what he's going through, what is he experiencing? And then alleviating the pain. Frankly, Adam, I don't know how they do what they do. I, oh, I mean, the emotional I, fortitude they, they have is amazing. They're a different I, type of person. I got to yeah, say, they are. yeah, I, I'd be a basket case. I could never do it. Um, but, you know, hospice care as well, it used to just be for end of life. And now they've extended it where there's many people. My grandfather was on hospice for like eight years and it was really as he aged. Now, he was in his 90s at the time, lived to 99, just a handful of days short of his 100th birthday. And they were great throughout the whole process as he was aging, kind of helping out along the way. Traditionally, we think of hospice, it is end of life care, but now it's actually been extended to quite a bit more. So check that out, though, because like you said, Adam, I mean, it's something I think that's that's not looked at as frequently as it probably should be, because they can do a much, much better job than we can. They, they absolutely can. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's everything's different, right? Everybody's situation is unique. And so, um, you know, our, our I don't want to say my situation is what everybody's going to get. But because my mom was sort of in the acute last week of her life, um, you know, had, had, had she gone home, they would have set up hospice services for her and, and people would have come from time to time and it would have been great, but we would have had to be the primary caregivers or pay out of pocket for somebody to, you know, deal with her catheter and shower her and feed her and all that stuff, right? So you have to put this sort of patchwork of resources together. But I will say again, in my mom's particular case, she went to this amazing place and it was because she had no assets, it was, it was all free. You know, now there's some massive donors, you know, that are paying for all of this to make it uh, make, make it actually work and fun. But for somebody who had no assets at the end of her life, she had a I mean, if we had a hundred million dollars, I don't know if I could have found a better place to take better care of her. Right. Um, and the fact that that she didn't have to pay out of pocket for it was, again, like I said, just a godsend. So I, I just want to underscore, you know, it's not necessarily a magic bullet in every single case, but it'll definitely be a very valuable part of the component. I have clients that they they don't have they have some charitable intent, but it's either head organizations and a lot of them are hospice because of how they relatives were treated, that they're leaving something to the hospice foundation. So it's a great resource uh, for you overall to do your great. homework. Go no, hospice. Yep, yeah, no, good Go deal hospice. for sure. So, you know, Adam, I like what you mentioned when somebody retires about starting to check off the boxes, make sure you have all these things done. And I've seen some very successful couples where they do that initially when they retire. They've done a little bit along the way, start to really finalize some things. But once they reach other milestones, it may be a big birthday, an anniversary, they'll spend time getting together and actually, you know, okay, we did this at 60 and 65. Now we're 75. We're going to go back and digitize memories like, like we mentioned here. I think this is so important because such so many things get lost. Technology changes. I remember the first time I think we received things from my in-laws. It was still in VHS tapes. I'm not sure I know where to put those things right now, right? We had to go get them converted to CDs. Then you start to convert them to, um, you know, cards. And, you know, as things continue to progress, I think we need to stay up with that. And it gets more difficult, but there's also a lot of places out there that will help you with that. Absolutely. It just started to interrupt. But we, so we've been going through all this with all my mom's stuff. And like there were old slide carousels. Do you remember those slides that you would have the slide projector? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know anybody that that <laughs> knows how to convert those things, let alone view them these days. I still I don't know where you start with that. My dad's and legacy box is one of those services that you give them everything. They digitize it. Right. This is such a cool way to open your communications to. Like I've had one client that took everything. They had some eight millimeter stuff from their wedding and all that. And they turned it into this digitization. And they had a little party around that, going through the highlights of their lives. They're right down to like the baby showers. And, and it opened the conversation to state planning. So th these kinds of services like Legacy Box, Legacy Box is one of the biggest. Digitize those memories. Use those memories as a way to communicate 
your life to family and what you want to leave for them. Can, and, can I just make one idea on here too, just to get it out in, in, in the world here, which is sure. um, when you go to someone's celebration of life, you know, they're, they're the service for, for after their funeral, you know, there are just wonderful things that are said about these people, right? You know, everybody remembers the best of the departed, right? And I always, when I'm at these things, I'm like, why can't we do something like this when the person's still alive, right? Why can't they, you know, why can't we let them hear how much they mattered to us? How, you know, we, we can show them, you know, how much they've meant to us and all that stuff. And the process of digitizing these memories, ideally while they're still alive, or let's say the guy who's retiring, right? You know, he's, he's you know, adding, all, you know, getting all this stuff digitized and whatnot. Why not use that as an excuse to kind of have like a, a living celebration party, right? Where everybody gets to show up and, you know, reflect all that to them while they're still around and can hear it and appreciate right. it. It's a it's a great precursor to those conversations that we've talked about. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. It puts everything in a different light. You know, you could see what your grandmother was doing. I mean, you know, I digitized a lot of my daughter, like growing up. I can't tell you how many videos and we just digitized them. And, you know, she doesn't care to watch him now. She's 25. She's going to live forever. But in 30 years, 40 years, she might decide that, well, it'd be really cool. And also to see her grandmother uh, at her wedding shower, all that stuff. So, you know, yeah, I think it's great. And it, again, it goes back to this digitization of things that is going to occur, whether we like it or not. Um, and this is a way to do it. Matter of fact, a lot of clients as part of this progression planning and the life planning will go ahead and they'll start decluttering and they'll take, I have clients that have slide carousels from every vacation I've taken in the seventies. They're using places like legacy box to put them because they're great slides. Um, you know, I could see them. I put them up to the light and I can go up. Like, wow, these are great. Get them digitized. And then, you know, they create a montage and it's just so cool to go through that with your family. Um, some of them really want to see it, especially the grandkids. They love it. Kids are like, yeah, and, and if I can just piggyback on a word you just said there, which was declutterize. <laughs> so again, having just gone through all this, um, first off, you know, my brother, and I left my mom's place with just boxes of old photos and stuff, right. That are just crammed together. You know, they're, a lot of them aren't in great shape. Um, but it's just a bunch of, you know, stuff, right. And, uh, we're having them digitized right now, right? So to be able to basically kind of get rid of the physical stuff and still keep all the memories, but now have them live virtually, just it, it's a lot less clutter that we have to deal with, but way above and beyond just the photos themselves, right? When you go and clean out somebody's place after they're gone, as Danny was saying, in most cases, the you know the, the parent assumes the kids want the home, but in most cases, they don't want the house. Well, I'll tell you, they definitely don't want most of the stuff that's in the house. Right. Oh, yeah. you know, most of all the stuff, the other crap that we just carry with us in life, you know, unless it's a true valuable, like a real antique or has tremendous sentimental value to your kids, which a lot of your stuff, frankly, quite frankly, doesn't um, your kids are just dealt with. All right. How do we get rid of this junk? Right. And you know, my brother and I had to go through all that. And I came home and I kind of looked around my life and I'm like, you know what, as I'm being honest with myself, my kids are going to throw out almost everything I'm dragging around with me, too. My right? kids going to put everything on them. I'd be like Rosso's eBay corner. I mean, yeah. listen, they, they they don't want stuff anymore. You, you look at the generation will change into smaller homes. I wrote up in my book 12, 10 years ago, small homes would be very popular, tiny homes, living smaller, living for experiences. They, When we were growing up, we wanted stuff. They don't want stuff. So I and just want to say, like, when we talk about this being a kindness, like decluttering before you is a, a, have, is a, have to... Is a, yeah. It's a massive kindness yeah. to your kids. <laughs> oh, I go to my dad's house. You know, when I, when I stop by there once a week or two, I'm throwing stuff away out of his garage. Like, what is this? Let's get rid of this stuff. Yeah, let's start knocking this out now. Yeah, I'm you're doing your kid. future self a huge favor there, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> if she throws away my Pee Wee Herman doll, I'm coming back. Hey, man. <laughs> That's probably worth something these days. Yeah. All right. What's next? Well, this is it, guys. We appreciate y'all spending time. Thank you, Adam, for having us today. Uh, just a little bit about us. We are fiduciaries. It's a registered investment advisor. We feel like this is extremely important because we can have no conflicts of interest. All of your interests have to be put above ourselves. Um, we do maintain a discipline with managing wealth. 
So as Lance talks frequently, weekly with Adam, you guys probably have a very good understanding as far as how we manage money. This is just one bit and kind of piece of what we do on the other side of the ledger, so to speak, as far as how we, we look at financial planning and looking at all facets of life. I think that's so important. And this is a big, big topic. So please, I hope you gain something from this and you guys put it to use. Um, knock this stuff out, make your life easier, make your kid's life easier, beneficiaries, heirs, charities you want to give to. Um, you know, I think you'll be, you're going to make, you're going to feel good about it and you're going to make your heirs life so much easier. And remember, right. it's not death planning, it's progression planning and it's a revisiting of your life. Think of it again, go through those mindset change. It's important. And the satisfaction from people we talk to who get this stuff done, how warm and, and, and wonderful they feel knowing that they're going to maximize the time they have left. They're not morbid. They're not looking forward to die. They just want to make sure that their family is taken care of. And I can't explain a better feeling than that. And, but you got to get over that emotional hurdle we talked about in the beginning and look at it just through a different lens. And uh, it takes a little time. But you'll get it done. You know, Richard, I, I love how you position that. And to me, it's it's not death planning, like you said. It's it's circle of life planning, right? Mm -hmm. Which is you know putting the right resolution on the arc of your life, and then setting up your progeny as best you can to take over the torch from you once you're gone. Um, guys, thanks so much. This has been so great, so helpful, so useful. Like you said, it's a topic people don't talk about and really need to. And I think you've done a really great job showing how people can tackle this in a very, you know, doable, uh, emotionally possible way. Um, so thanks for opening that door. Um, there are a couple of, of questions I'm sure folks will have on certain topics. We flagged a few of them like, you know, insurance. Um, there's also just sort of the whole medical planning side of this. Right. There's, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and, and Medigap insurance and, you know, just all the ways of trying to figure out, like, am I am I parents or am I, you know, are we fully covered for all the things that we potentially, you know, are going to need from a, a medical standpoint? Um, are you guys able to drill deeply into I know you can on insurance. Um, how about on that medical side? Absolutely. We talk about Medicare all the time. We help people right. make the right decisions because you don't want to make bad decisions with Medicare and you need to understand the difference between Medigap and Medicare Advantage. In other words, J.J. Walker, Joe Namath, you know, Bill Shatner, all my idols growing up are now selling us on this great, great Medicare Advantage. But you need to understand, is it so great? So we uh, we're well versed. We, we do what I say. Um, I didn't put it in here, but I say our advisors, Danny and I and our other advisors, we are um, we love financial dust bunnies. And what I mean by that is a lot of financial advisors don't really dig under the bed and really go over those topics that are so important, like Social Security and Medicare. We do. We're the Swiffers. We are going in there. We're cleaning them up. We're talking to you about them. That's what we do, because those topics are very, very important. So. We're very happy to do Medicare and Social Security presentations as well. That's an area that we we spend a lot of time, right? It's a great value added for our clients, Danny, right? Because we see a lot of clients make or get bad advice and have make mistakes that can cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, it's really unfortunate how it's it's often overlooked because like we talked about earlier, Adam, so many advisors or um, brokers, whatever you want to call, you know, it depends on which which facet you work in or which lane, so to speak. But they only focus on one thing. And you have to focus on it all when we're talking about financial planning. So Medicare, Social Security are certainly big, big aspects. Medicare, Rich and I do teach classes on Medicare here internally uh, with our clients. And I think that that's really important. And then understanding how it works within your financial plan. There are a lot of ways we talk about as for accumulating assets, where should you be accumulating from a diversification perspective, what type of investment vehicles should you be using in the sense of do you use a Roth, do you use a life insurance policy? How do you diversify funds when you're in distribution phase to not increase your Medicare premiums? But then, you know, going above and beyond and talking about what is Medicare Part A, B, D, C, which is advantage, which one would be best for you? Uh, is it a cost, uh, you know, kind of a cash flow issue? and a cost uh, perspective that you're looking at, or is it big picture? And so we can certainly get in the weeds. We've done that quite a bit. We'd love to visit with you guys on that as well.
No, great. I mean, I think it's a hugely important topic. But again, folks watching, let us know in the comments section below if this is a, a webinar that you'd like to see Richard and Danny put together uh, for the wealth and audience at some point in the future. I think you're going to want, but I don't want to assume. So let me know. And if demand's high enough, we will do another one of these soon focused on, on those topics. Um, guys, thanks so much again. You know, Lance, who's on this program with me every week, and he's going to come back on in just a few seconds. We're going to do a little wrap up, uh, a little mini market recap. Um, but, you know, Lance's job, he's a portfolio manager, right? As he says, his job is basically to make sure that the money that you are putting away is keeping up with inflation, right? It's not getting, a, it's purchasing power is not getting eroded. I see you guys as really just dealing with the the life side of money, right? You know, how, 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 what, what, what should I be doing money wise to be able to live my life the way that I want to, whether it's retire well, you know, shrug off this mortal coil well at the end of life. Uh, put my kids through school, whatever, right? So it's such a valuable service. Folks watching, if you want to set up uh, a, a discussion with uh, Danny uh, and, and Richard coming out of this, uh, just go to the usual URL I mentioned. Just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Uh, in the description of what you're looking for, just type in progression planning. And again, if you want to talk to these two specifically, uh, there's a drop down menu there at the end of the form that says, do you know which advisor you want to talk with? Just click RIA. You'll be connected with them directly. Guys, thanks so much. I'm going to bring Lance back on. We're going to do our weekly market recap, but it's been wonderful talking to you guys about this. Thanks so much for all your time. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. All right. Well, look, folks, as I said, uh, we provide just a quick glimpse into, you know, what the key elements were for the week here. Just a couple of minutes here with, with Lance as, we, uh, as we, we make our way out of the presentation here with Richard and Danny. And, and by the way, Lance, um, these guys did not disappoint. They did a fantastic job. Kudos to you for having such great, skilled uh, experts on your, your team. And they just so clearly are keyed in on helping people, which is one of the huge reasons why we love to work with you and your firm. Um, okay. So real quick. Uh, what caught your attention this past week? What key takeaways should folks, uh, you know, take from this week? Uh, really, you know, it, it was really just a continuation of the correction that we've talked about. You know, it's interesting kind of the media is, is, has been kind of, oh, my gosh, you know, is this the start of the next bear market? And it's like you just had five months of an advance where the markets were up 15 percent year to date. <laughs> uh, having a bit of a correction here is not only healthy, it should be expected. Overall, the market has done nothing wrong technically. There's nothing to be concerned about. We're now getting fairly oversold on a lot of different fronts. Um, however, um, you know, so having said all that, there were some key kind of takeaways this week. First of all, NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA was the big news story this week. And, and again, uh, as you know, kind of not surprisingly, they knocked the cover off the ball in terms of AI. But there's some interesting anomalies to their earnings. You know, last quarter, we saw a big chunk of the earnings came from an order from uh, Elon Musk and his new AI venture. Uh, this quarter was a $2.6 billion order that was, that was kind of backed by BlackRock uh, through some of their core fibers. So, you know, it was interesting to see there's these kind of one-off hits that are driving these very big uh, earnings gains or revenue gains for NVIDIA, the question, and again, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with any of that. That's that's how business works, right? They're selling product, they're making money. The question that, in, that you have to ask yourself is sustainability. Can you continue to grow at these rates going forward? And, and that comes down to a question of valuation. When you're talking about a stock trading at 40 times price to sales, earnings growth is the key, and revenue growth, obviously, the key driver for that. So it's something to take away from there. Uh, the other big news, of course, on Friday, Jerome Powell uh, gave his Jackson Hole Summit speech, and it was absolutely, and I'm going to write an article on this, so don't worry about it, but it was absolutely- <laughs> I wasn't, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure you're going to write an article on everything that happened this week. <laughs> well, you know, but the thing was, is that he said, well, you know, inflation, it's a function of, of you know, this mismatch between supply and demand absolutely took no responsibility for the fact that both the Federal Reserve and the government, the administration itself, were solely responsible for that massive mismatch between supply and demand by shuttering the economy and flooding the system with just trillions of dollars of deficit spending, accepts no responsibility of that, but says, hey, you know what, we're going to get it all back, you know, uh, to, to order at 2% inflation. That's our target. And this is the thing we keep talking about, ultimately, is that if inflation goes to 2%, rates are going to go down, 
because economic growth has to slow dramatically more from here. And that was one point that he did bring up in his speech. He says the lag effect has yet to really take hold. And I think that's the one takeaway from that speech that investors really need to pay attention to. Hmm, the lag effect is definitely going to take, I, I've heard that somewhere. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's some weekly program that's just been saying that ad nauseum for months. Hmm. Uh, interesting. Well, this is, this, this is uh, so Adam Riley, this is going to be the clip of my article. I'm basically taking his speech. I'm going to break down his, his clip or, or I'm going to take a clip of what he says. And then I'm going to post the article or the video clip of everything that we've been talking about for the last year and a half. <laughs> so. Uh, all right. Well, look, um, and what was the market's knee-jerk reaction to this? I know it's still too early to know the, the direction it's going to permanently take, but. Well, uh, you know, we had initially markets were trading in the up early in the morning. They sold off a little bit into mid-morning and then they kind of started floundering around a bit around kind of flat line, um, you know, uh, so far. But we'll see, you know, I, I don't expect much of a big move in the market. The, it was really very much a nothing burger speech. It was absolutely the same thing that they've been saying now for the last several months. The, 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 the really interesting point, I guess, if you want to say what was the one thing that was missing in the speech is basically no mention of this whole big debate that's been going on in the media lately about the neutral raid and the R star. And of course, Nick Timrose's article that was out last week that, you know, had had the uh, the bond vigilantes worried that we're going to uptick uh, the base inflation rate. The, absolutely no mention of that. In fact, he was very clear that their target is 2%. It's still 2%. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he's leaving that trial balloon just dangling out there so far as, as a trial. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, you know, we'll get into this more next week when we can do the deep dive, but um, just love to get your quick response on uh, it. It was, it's been so interesting to me and I've talked about it with several experts on the channel this week, including your partner there at RIA, Michael Leibowitz. Um, it's amazing to me how the narrative has shifted from um, inflation's hot. We're all worried about inflation. And of course the Fed's going to pivot. And of course the economy can't uh, sustain this kind of cost of capital. And of course, rate cuts are coming any moment, any moment, any moment. We've heard that for like a year and a half. Now, all of a sudden, it's, oh, my God, bond yields are continuing to go up. They're going to keep going up higher from here. The Fed's going to take the federal funds rate to 6% or more. Like, yeah. all of a sudden, everybody has kind of almost given up hope on the pivot and are now wringing their hands about how the fact that, that yields are going to keep going higher forever, and all of a sudden, bonds are a death trap. So right. just curious to hear your thoughts on this narrative shift. I, uh, the only thing I can quote to you on that is the legendary Bob Farrell, who once said that when all experts agree, something else always tends to happen. And you remember last year, everybody said, hey, going to have a recession. Now we have everybody saying no recession. Last year, oh, rates are going to get cut. This year, rates are only going to go higher. So take from it what you will. But Bob Farrell, as always, is right, is that when all experts agree, something else always tends to happen. All right. Well, we got to end it here, just uh, given the fact that today was a deep dive focus on the progression planning for, for Danny and Richard. But but last question for you is, um, has anything happened this week that has changed your guys' investing behavior? And tied to that, what trades, if any, did you make this week? Uh, we, you know, we've been making trades over the last, you know, kind of month or so, just kind of repositioning the portfolio. Nothing really happened of consequence this past week. We've been expecting this correction. We've been saying use this correction as an opportunity to rebalance portfolios. We've been doing that. Uh, we'll probably do a little bit more work next week. Um, probably do a little. Uh, we've got a couple of trades kind of on deck that we're kind of looking at maybe for next week, but nothing committed to yet. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about that next Friday. All right, folks. Well, look, as we wrap up here, um, first and foremost, if you have been inspired to take action based upon the presentation here that Richie, Richard and Danny gave, um, then don't waste a moment, folks. Go to wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Uh, if you specifically want to talk to Richard and Danny about this topic, uh, make sure that when you're filling out that short form, uh, there's a little draw down, uh, drop down menu that says, do you know which advisor you want to talk with? Uh, just make sure you select RIA there. And, um, you know, in your financial objectives field, just type in progression planning. Um, and uh, as we do every week, um, we want to thank everybody for investing your time in this channel. If you continue to want to see us bring you not just the weekly market recap every week, but also present special presentations like the one we just had, please vote your support for that by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lance, thanks so much for setting this up, bringing your team on here. 
Look forward to seeing you next week, buddy. Absolutely. See you then. All right, everyone else, thanks so much for watching.